All right, good evening, everyone. We are now live on Facebook. Welcome to tonight's event. Tonight's event is part of our 90 Days Around the World promotion. We are so excited to take you on a wine tasting tonight. Tonight on the line, we are thrilled to be joined by Vittorio Marzotto, the Senior Director of Fine Wines for Santa Margarita Wines. He's gonna be taking us on a tasting of four different wines and give us a little bit of history on the brand. He's gonna answer some of your questions as well. Uh, also on the line, we have Mary, the area manager for Santa Margarita and Colin from Martinetti. It's thanks to these two guys that we actually have these wines in our stores. So for those of you who love uh, the Santa Margarita wines as much as I do, let's give them a quick round of applause. So uh, also on the line is, of course, the fabulous Chad Gibson from our wine marketing team. Uh, Chad, oh, excuse me. Uh, Chad is here to answer all of your questions about pricing, inventory, and any other wine questions you may have. So Vittorio, thank you so much for being here tonight. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, you were recently named uh, to the 40 under 40 tastemakers list by wine enthusiasts. Congratulations. Uh, and I, I understand that your family actually founded the Santa Margarita Winery. Could you tell us a little bit about the history? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, everybody, for having me tonight. And uh, it's an honor, of course. And um, I'm very uh, happy to be with you. Um, yes, as you said, I happen to be part of the uh, fourth generation of the Marzotto family, who was uh, the founding family of Santa Margherita back in the 1935, when my great grandfather started started everything uh, from scratch in the in the northeast uh, countryside of the Venetian region. Um, we were in the, they were at the time in the middle of the two war, world wars, so very different uh, time as uh, as of today. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we have a uh, quite a long history as an Italian family in the wine uh, uh, industry, and um, we're about you know just celebrated uh, you know more than 80, 80, 85 years. So it's like it's been a quite a long term. Most important is that the, the, the family, the company has always been very committed and, and excited to, uh, you know, yes, uh, keep the tradition in place, but uh, also to, to try to be innovative and, and to uh, experiment in new territories, new, new areas, new, new techniques and technologies to really uh, be at the cutting edge uh, level of this uh, uh, wine industry today. So we have a uh, uh, about uh, what we call a mosaic of, uh, of uh, wineries and estates that we created or we uh, partner with, we own from, from uh, different regions of Italy. And uh, tonight, uh, of course, we're, we have the, the focus on the, on the mother brand, uh, Santa Margherita. And uh, I just prepared also a little uh, presentation for our folks, our you know, viewers tonight, so they can also just not looking only at me, but uh, maybe some videos, some some uh, some quick slides that I like to share, if you don't mind. That would be great. Very good. So, ready to start. Here we go. As said, uh, we're like in. Um, in the middle of the two world walls. And uh, um, here, this is the famous uh, logo that I, I guess uh, you recognize from the label. And this is actually was the, uh, the family villa uh, where my great grandfather uh, used to live back in the days. And today it represents the, uh, it, it is part of the local uh, municipality and is the, the city hall. So, so when once my, uh, at that point, my great grand, my gr uh, great uh, uncle, sorry, he um, he inherited the, the villa, the property from his father, Gaetano Marzotto, my my great grandfather. Um, he when he moved out, he decided to donate uh, the the property to the lo local community because that's it's always been a part of the uh, the social uh, um, approach, the social responsibility of the family that uh, still today we're, we're, we're trying to 
to keep uh, to keep on in in our new area. But uh, I'm going to tell you more later. So these are the four um, the four cores. So of course the the Pinot Grigio and our uh, Chianti Classico Reserva from uh, uh, Panzano, and then the two sparkling wine with a, a new a little bit more more modern. Uh, uh, approach and image uh, that uh, it's been very well received so far. So again, the, the history. So we go back to the, you know, the black and white uh, pictures, as you can see, this is my, uh, my, my, my great grandfather, uh, Gaetano, and, uh, and in the middle, the most important person of the family, the matriarch, uh, my great grandmother, uh, that was named uh, Margherita. So hence, you know, the name of the winery is Santa Margherita. So the, there was the, the, the smart uh, uh, decision of my great grandfather that beside being a successful man in the, in the business uh, at that time, uh, you know, he, he really uh, made uh, the point and uh, he, he, he named the winery after uh, his beloved wife, Margherita. So, the um, the story starts in this in this area and the northeast, as I said, of uh, of the Venetian uh, region. Um, and uh, this area was a very like um, uh, kind of a, an abundant land. Um, so um, the idea was uh, of my my great grandfather was to try to reclaim uh, this area. It was like swampy. Was you know like, like uh, a lot of water, a lot of uh, um, difficult land to to work, but uh, he envisioned the potential from the from this land in order to uh, try to um, to 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 make it like a, a definitely workable and functional for for the local uh, people to to work. And he created this um, one of the first uh, what we call agri agri uh, business center uh, in in Italy that was not only wine making at that time was yes production of grapes of course but also um other other uh, assets like uh, in, in the agriculture so uh vegetables crops uh, grains uh, um as well as a a glass uh, a glass uh, factory that uh, he he basically decided to build next to the winery so he could and next to the the, uh, the, 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 the other facility, the, the production manufacturer facility in order to produce the, the glass actually to, 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 to use and to bottle the wine, to bottle the, the food uh, um, products pr produced. And, uh, and that was very smart. So to cut off like the, you know, the, 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 the chain and then be uh, very uh, sustainable in somehow that definitely it's something that uh, it's very important for us and for our family. Um, moving forward, um, we have uh, um, a little bit of history here that I like to, to show you in just a, a quick, uh, quick view uh, from the beginning, 1935. So the first milestone in terms of winemaking for Santa Margherita, definitely it's our Prosecco Superiore from the Valdobbiadene area. area. Uh, believe it or not, it, it was, you know, first before the, the famous Pinot Grigio that came after in the 1961. So I like to have a first toast because otherwise, you know, my, my voice uh, probably is gonna, is gonna slow down. So uh, if you guys, if, uh, if, you, if you have at home our uh, Prosecco Santa Margherita Superiore, I encourage you to have a glass with me tonight now and then we can continue this, the journey together. So, salute, cheers, and good luck for everything. Oh, delicious. So, um, after the, 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 the 1952, that uh, was the year when my great-grandfather uh, envisioned the, the potential of this, um, this uh, uh, territory. So, we're in the, in the hilly area of the Venetian region, so uh, right on the bottom of the uh, the pre-Alps, the range of the mountain range that is very famous for, for skiing, for, for, for hiking, for, for 
even um, you know dining experience because there are a lot of beautiful restaurants in the mountains now but uh, you know he envisioned the, the potential of this category that now is very successful but back then it was a very uh, one of the pioneer and uh, and for that reason we we had the 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 ability the the the, the, the fortune to to really um, get to the to the next level with the with the prosecco with in terms of the the uh, you know the, the 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 production of the of the wine the technique the technology um of course the the we were there when uh, uh, other producer today hey, that you know you can know you can um, haven't heard about today there were not there at that time so uh, we we got lucky and we and and, and established this uh, very incredible i would say model of uh, relationship with uh, our uh, uh, growers that they became part of the the, the family um the the valdo biadene area is it's an incredible uh, uh, territory for wine making the conegliano valdo biadene is one of the most uh, uh, the, you know, uh, landscape and uh, and uh, and so you know the community there is uh, very uh, um, committed to keep this environment uh, at, at the best way you know possible in the best shape possible. So you have, if you happen to be there, you, you have you don't want to miss the Strada del Vino, the wine road, which is like a, a you know a very narrow road that goes into these uh, villages and then uh, hills and goes up and down, turns and. Uh, and it's it's really fa fantastic. So it's a, also uh, just to give you an, an, a, the sense of the place we received like uh, last year or a couple of years ago with the the, the UNESCO uh, World Wild Heritage, which is one of the most important uh, um, uh, accolades, the recognition of you know in terms of uh, uh, you know the environment, uh, the role of the social the of the communities, so the, the 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 role of the people. And uh, um, you know the overall uh, uh, connection between nature, um, people, and uh, product, and product basically. Uh, so we're very. There are only two uh, UNESCO uh, wine regions in Italy, and uh, and this uh, this is the third one now. So just to give you an idea, it's a Roero in the in the Piemonte area, and then Val d'Orcia in in uh, down in the Brunello, uh, south of the Brunello. Montalcino area and uh, but let's move on because we have a lot of things to, to talk about even later so the 1961 were, was definitely the year where uh, we released for the first time our Pinot Grigio in the in the Alto Adige region which is basically this is another map that gives a little bit more the sense of the place so um, we are here in the northeast uh, as, a, as a headquarter the the Valdo Biaden area is up here close to the, the, the mountain range and the, the Alto Adige river valley is basically this uh, valley here that stretches north to south and it's a very like a uh, alpine environment uh, area. And, uh, and that, yes, and this is uh, uh, the, the, the place of the, where the Pinot Grigio Santa Marita was born and where still today we, we have uh, our, our vineyards, our production with the with the with the growers as well and uh, etc the the rest of the map that you see here and all these other brands are part of the family and those are the other estates that we have uh, established as a previ previously um, uh, said uh, we establish we create we we we, we partner with with other local uh, producer. And this is what we call today the mosaic of a Santa Margherita family, where all the, these uh, wineries and estates are, are part of the same family, but they have their own uh, um, independence in terms of the, the local team, uh, the, the, the local uh, uh, tradition and the heritage they want to keep uh, uh, along with them. And so this is the beauty of the, 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 the portfolio, you know, the, 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 the wine group, Gruppo, Gruppo di, di Vinicolo, we call it in Italy. Now, since I already talked uh, quite a lot, uh, I like to show you some videos, some, some, mm, some you know, 
vineyards and even if we're here in the in US uh, uh, far away, but still we, we miss a lot Italy. So let me show you a very quick uh, video um, from our brand ambassador, Alberto, that is gonna show, show us a little bit more in depth where I try to envision so far. I'm Alberto Golini, brand ambassador of Santa Margherita. When you hear Santa Margherita, you probably think of our iconic Pinot Grigio, but there is a lot more to our story. It all began in 1935, when Count Gaetano Marzotto introduced in the Venetian countryside a new vision of modern agriculture. Since then, Santa Margherita has grown to encompass vineyards across Italy, producing distinctive, authentic wines of regional character such as Pinot Grigio from Alto Adige and Val d'Adige, Prosecco from Val d'Obiadene, where we are now, Sparkling Rosé from Veneto, Chianti Classico Reserva from Tuscany. We pride ourselves on being eco-friendly, employing the highest standards of sustainable agriculture with the reduction of fertilizers, water saving, in some cases with organic farming. Our winery is 100% energy self-sustained thanks to the combination of solar and biomass power generation. Santa Margarita offers a wide range of profiles characterized by elegance, subtlety, richness of flavors, authentic representatives of their terroirs. Pinot Grigio, crisp, savory, so versatile to be paired with both delicate and more elaborate dishes. Prosecco, fruity and vibrant, excellent as an aperitif, ideal with light appetizers. Sparkling rosé, delicate, aromatic, amusing with savory starters and surprising with Asian cuisine. Chianti Classico Reserva, rich with great structure, the perfect match for meat-based preparations. Our wines are crafted for the taste of today's wine lovers and we invite you to pair people and put in your life with our wines. Cheers! Okay, so just uh, I hope you like it and uh, it's always like uh, very nice to, to, to see what is behind the glass. So we want to start, as we said, with the Prosecco, and uh, I want to give you a little bit more depth, uh, um, you know, with this map uh, to understand what I was talking about before. You see the, the, the Veneto region, the Venetian region, and the Friuli Venezia Giulia are basically uh, the two regions uh, where today you can uh, uh, produce the Prosecco DOC, which is the the, the greater area of the of the Prosecco, you see the DOC here. Uh, when you when it comes to the DOCG, so you basically add the, the an, an extra level of, of uh, certification, and uh, it's it's basically the guarantee the, the guarantee of the of the local uh, um, authorities, the consortium that governs on the local production about you know that the, the rules are very important and they have to be. Uh, you know, followed by all the producers. So when it comes to the G, I will say the G is the maximum level of uh, sophistication in the Prosecco, in, in general, in, 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 in the Italian uh, appellations. Uh, and moreover here, because, uh, you know, Prosecco today is a, is a large, um, you know, uh, category. You have, of course, good quality Prosecco from the flatland, the DOC area, which is, again, the greater area. But definitely the, the, the niche is the DOCG, the G where we have the, the two local uh, villages of Valdobiaden and Conegliano. So this was the historical area. And this is very different in terms of, not only because it's historical, but because it's, uh, as I said, it's the hilly area. So there, there is a very different, uh, you know, microclimate and soil and, uh, and, uh, and experience as well from the producer. Um, so, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. So this is like uh, our, you know, one of our vineyards in the Refrontolo uh, area, which is a little village here. You see right in the middle here where we are and we have our 
state inside the, the historical uh, um, appellation of uh, Prosecco. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the, the beauty is up, it's out there, you know, you cannot, you know, uh, argue with that. Um, so the, what about this wine? So the, the, the facts are, I try to, to recap some, uh, some major information here for, for our people. Um, definitely the DOCG Prosecco, again, it just represents 17% of the total production of Prosecco in, in, in this area when it comes to the comparison with the DOC versus DOCG. So it gives you the sense of the exclusivity, you know, the, the highest designation for this, uh, um, for this wine. And Santa Margherita, because of his tradition and my great grandfather's vision back in the 1952, it's, all, it's always been in this uh, you know, niche and we always we'll want to be. Um, just to, to, you know, reflect our commitment with the, the, excellent, uh, the, the excellent quality of our, of our wines and our grapes, of course. So 100% Glera, just to give you a little bit of uh, information, technical information. So Prosecco is not the, the name of the grape, that is the name of the, of the appellation now. And uh, the grape is called Glera, okay? So this, uh, this name here, G -L -L -E. E R A. The style can be, uh, you know, like in, in Champagne, like in a method classic, classic uh, or traditional. We can have the different uh, level of uh, dosage. The dosage is uh, for who doesn't know, but I'm sure you're you're all expert. Is uh, that uh, uh, final uh, touch that the, the, the producer, the sparkling wine producer, they add to the wine after the secondary fermentation. So after uh, creating the, the bubbles, the carbonation, you have to add this little dosage that uh, helps the, 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 the wine to be balanced. If it's uh, too, too bitter, if it's too, too softer, if it's too acid. So there is a little bit of this dosage that is very important. And all this, the producer, the sparkling wine producer, they, they they, they have their own recipe. In the Prosecco too, we have this, uh, the same uh, re re regulation. So we have basically uh, what we call usually the, the brute and the brute is the most common, uh, uh, let's say the, the, the classification. And then we have the extra uh, dry, which is a, a little bit uh, softer. And when I say softer, usually it means sweeter, but don't get me wrong, it's not a sweet wine. It just has a little bit more that kind of a fruitiness that is more enhanced by a little bit a higher level of residual sugar. No more technical things unless you want me to, to tell you. And um, let's just enjoy the wine. So the, the, you know, the beautiful bubbles that they come out uh, are nice and tiny. This is usually when you have the the nice and, and small tiny bubbles is, is due to the time on the lease, on the, on the dead east. So the more you keep the wine in this uh, environment in contact with the lease, then the more um, creaminess and, 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 um, and softness you have in the, in the, in the bubbles. So they're very compact, but still, uh, um, you know, in, present in the, in, the, in the glass. So I, I usually prefer that this kind of style uh, because it's more elegant when it's not aggressive on the on the palate when you drink it it's like almost like I want to say like a steel wine but you have that kind of little little uh, uh, carbonation that touch the back of the palate and, and help also with the food to really appreciate better the food and uh, sometimes you have these big you know bubbles that they they are almost too aggressive so you lose the the perception of the of the buds in somehow, <laughs> and so you, you cannot taste the, uh, you know, the food and then the wine itself. Um, the, the, the method of Prosecco is called Charmat, and uh, that's the, the, as opposed to the method traditional or Champenoise, uh, which is basically the, the, the secondary fermentation takes place in, in the bottle. And in this case, the Prosecco, the secondary fermentation takes place in a, in a pressure tank. So it's a bigger vessel that we use uh, and uh, and when it comes to Santa Margherita, one of the 
advanced technology that we put it in place is the the tank position the 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 the, the position of the tank in the winery we keep it horizontal so in this way we kind of simulate the same process of the bottle fermentation that stays that stays laid down horizontal before you know uh, i mean for for aging and we gain much more you know contact with the lease so this this leasiness is really key to to make the wine more um more and more complex more and more um also the the you know the 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 uh, the, the the softness of the wine tends to be uh, very homogeneous. So it, it is a key element factor that we really uh, are one of the few wineries to do these techniques, but the results are, are, are very, very positive. So again, a little bit of a uh, map, uh, if you want to look at the, the three different, uh, the four different areas where, where we produce the, the, our, our wines. And um, here again, the the, the map of Italy with the, uh, the brown uh, region is the one that we just talked about. So the Venetian with the Prosecco. Then uh, we have in the north, uh, the red here is the Trentino Alto Adige, which is uh, basically this valley that goes from north to south. I was talking about before, and this is a very alpine area where we produce the Pinot Grigio and then Tuscany back here in the heart of, the, of, of Tuscany between Siena and, and Firenze, where it's called the Chianti Classico. Um, so here is the north, here's the, the, the alpine environment, our, uh, the native region of our beautiful Pinot Grigio. And this is like, this picture is, you know, it's amazing, it speaks on, on, on itself. You know, you have the valley floor with the uh, crops of the apples down here, and then the, the vines that they start raising on the and climbing on the on the side of the of the hills of the you see on the on, the, on this side, the lake Caldaro, which is a very influential lake, the mountain alpine. These 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 peaks they up are they go up to uh, you know three four thousand meters. So we're talking about uh, uh, nine twelve thousand. Um, uh, feet above sea level, and uh, and the, 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 of course the microclimate uh, really helps to 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 infuse into these wines the, all the white wine from Alto Adige, specifically our Pinot Grigio here, finds a different environment. So this this beauty, the purity, the cleaning, the clean of the cleaning of the air, uh, the bright uh, sunshine. Um, the, the, the temperature variation, very cold during the night and then warmer during the, the, the day, really they, they, they work perfectly for, for, for the, the Pinot Grigio clones that we, uh, we have up here. Um, so since we're talking about the Pinot Grigio, I encourage you to have a little taste with me now so we can better enter into this uh, region together and discover some stories. So one of my favorite story is basically the, the model behind the, the, this area. It's a sort of a similar model that I, my, uh, you know, referenced before to the Prosecco Superiore, uh, where you have a lot of uh, small producer growers and uh, it's, everything is very uh, narrow, it's very, uh, you know, compact because the mountains, the, the forest, the woods, uh, the rocks, they, they, they own this area. So just to give you an idea, only 7% of the old region of Alto Adige is, po is, is, is populated. So it's, it's where people can, can have a, you know, a house or, you know, there is a space to, to create an, an, an establishment. And, um, and the rest is all nature. So it's, it's incredible. Um, so the story here is, um, um, is basically um, the, 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 the history that uh, is also important in Italy and, and the, the depending on the different regions, but specifically here, we have this uh, uh, influence from the Austrian Hungarian empire that was in, uh, that ruled the, this area um, uh, until World War I. So from the uh, mid of the 18th uh, century, uh, sorry, 1800, uh, up to World War I, so the beginning of the 
20, 19, 20th century, so 1900. Um, this for about 200, uh, 250 years, I would say, um, they were here. And uh, Maria Teresa d'Austria, the, she was the, you know, the queen uh, of the empire. She um, really worked hard and, 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 and she um, uh, dictated in somehow a new um, rules, a new regulation in order to um, protect the community in terms of the, 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 um, the property of the families that were living up here, especially in the mountain areas, were basically um, designed uh, in, in terms of the size of the property um, to uh, allow the local family to produce their own uh, products like uh, fruit, vegetables, um, cattle, cattles, and, and so on. And uh, whatever was not uh, available inside the property would be, would be um, traded, like uh, give you a kilo or, or a pound of uh, apples for a pound of uh, butter or milk, uh, or, you know, that, that was the idea. So to protect the family heritage and the local um, uh, ownership of these uh, uh, beautiful uh, little farms. They, we call it mountain farms today. So uh, the, the, the idea was to protect them in, in terms of uh, a family of four people, so mother, father, and, and two kids. And this rule, this regulation, was, has been in, in, uh, uh, in effect until uh, the 2000, early 2000, so believe it or not. And why I'm telling you this is because this has... Um, establish a different uh, way to, 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 to uh, work in this area. So we, until the, the, the 2000, early 2000, we, anybody who was coming from outside was not able to purchase the, 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 the land and the vineyards and the, and the, you know, the properties because there was this, this, this regulation in, in, in effect. So uh, to prevent people to sell the, their own property in order to make sure that these families there stay here they the generation the future generation they would be you know you know working the, their own land to really make quality uh, products and and to export this product uh, uh, around uh, italy and around in in the north of the uh, of, uh, of europe of course in the german region uh, um, of uh, german speaking languages so um in, in fact, this area, is Alto Adige, is called also Sud Tyrol, which is the, um, the larger, greater area of uh, South uh, Bavaria, which is the southern part of the uh, German region and uh, uh, Austria as well. And, uh, and, and Sud Tyrol was the south part of the Tyrol. So that, that's, that's the, the idea where Alto Adige was um, and, uh, part of it, so until the World War I. Uh, what is my point? The point is that the influence of the German um, uh, tradition, the German precision and, uh, and the organization with the Italian creativity, flexibility, um, you know, the, 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 of course, the, 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 the Italian lifestyle that really, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's known uh, now as a very positive things. And this is also kind of reflects in the in the in the wine making in the in the in the, in the agriculture in the, in the wine viniculture and the, the the agriculture you know as a whole, and uh, and so this wine this this scream of of this alpine environment very clean very pure very precise but definitely with the soul of uh, the Italian the Mediterranean uh, Sea. Um, so they are warmer also sometimes in character. They work very well with the food. Um, our Pinot Grigio became uh, so popular because was the, yes, the winemaking uh, um, expertise that uh, basically brought us, uh, uh, put us on the map that in back in the days because uh, Santa Margherita was among the first producer to vinify the grape in, in uh, in white, because believe it or not, Pinot Grigio, I don't know if you are aware, but it's not a Chardonnay grape, like uh, white, 
is basically in a, it comes out of the device in a, in, a, in a copper color skin. So the big intuition at that time was to vinify off the skin, um, the, the wine. So the master was like, put it on in the, in the tank and, and, and to get the fermentation started in order to avoid the, the, the color extraction from the copper skin uh, uh, color grape of the Pinot Grigio. And that was a revolutionary, revolutionary for that time and, uh, and uh, to, con to preserve all these, uh, the characteristic of our Pinot Grigio today that are, you know, very, you, you know, very um, well received. So, um, you know, the, the, the softness of the fruit, uh, the, the apple, the, 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 uh, the, the, the pear, the, 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 the lemon zest uh, character that uh, comes out of this, uh, uh, you know, this alpine area and then this, the savory uh, profile that really helps this wine to be one of the most white, versatile white wine. And we, we usually talk about the secret weapon of a lot of sommelier no? in, uh, in, the, in our community today. So it's, a, it's a, an easy um, choice because it, it goes very, very well with a lot of uh, situation, with a lot of food, with a lot of, uh, you know, situation at home, at the restaurant. It's, uh, it, it's a very consistent and quality wine over the course of now uh, a long history um, that we can celebrate together. So again, um, if you have any question, I'm happy to stop myself talking and just uh, uh, come back to, to, to respond to you. Otherwise, uh, uh, Caroline, let me know. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, so this first one is for Chad, actually. So Chad, uh, while we were talking about the sparkling, uh, somebody asked what the price point was at our stores. And so I was wondering if you could maybe just tell our viewers the price point of the four wines that Vittorio is tasting with us tonight. So currently the, uh, the sparkling, the Prosecco is on sale for $19.99 at our stores. Um, it is widely available in a, a large amount of stores. Um, the, uh, the rosé is also available in, a in the same amount of stores. And so is the Chianti. The Chianti actually is a little higher price point than the, um, than the other wines, but it is, um, still on a great deal. The current price for the Chianti, excuse me, one second. $21.99 right now on sale. So we, um, uh, Standard SRP here in New Hampshire is actually twenty nine nine nine. So this month you have a nice savings uh, to take advantage of. And same thing with the Brut Rosé, twenty seven nine nine SRP here in New Hampshire, but down to twenty two nine nine this month. Um, and the standard price on the Prosecco is twenty five nine nine. So deals on all three of those, and the Pinot Grigio is no exception at uh, eighteen ninety five. Awesome, thank you guys. You're welcome. And then we had another question asking what makes the Galera grape special? And Colin did answer that in the chat bar uh, here on Zoom. But Vittorio, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit for those who are watching on Facebook and might be curious about that grape. Oh, yes, I mean, the Galera grape uh, is, uh, is not a novel grape, like could be the Chard Chardonnay or Pinot Noir or Pinot Blanc. I don't know that are basically the grapes that are mostly used or Pinot Meunier for the Champenoise method or method traditional. However, uh, because it's, uh, it, 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 it is an aromatic grape, uh, it, it, it really enhances his uh, uh, soul of, 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 a, of a, a, a sparkling wine, because then you have the, the bubbles that uh, really support you know the the texture in the in the in the glass and the and the and the glare with these nuances of uh, uh, peach or apple again and uh, sometimes a little bit of a tropical um, uh, pineapple uh, they are very pleasant uh, uh, when it comes to the secondary fermentation so we always uh, uh, I prefer, personally, I like more when the glera has been uh, developed a little bit with the secondary fermentation, with the bubbles, as I said, and, uh, and it gets more complexity. 
together on, you know, on its own, like it would be a Pinot Grigio or a Chardonnay steel, I don't think it will deliver the same uh, uh, sensation, the same expression. And so again, it, it's been a really a, a discovery that, uh, you know, it came out of the blue because the, the Prosecco initially was, you know, creative on, in the bottle. So it was a bottle, uh, uh, re-fermented bottle by the nature in the, you know, by, 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 by chance in somehow because the 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 the, the peasant and at that time you know the little uh, growers when he was making their uh, his own uh, steel wine then he he usually after the the, the the vinification process the wine goes into the cellar in the basement to 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 stabilize to mature over the winter and then waiting for the springtime to uh, the warmer time to 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 be released and to be open you know, after some months of uh, maturation, then what happened is that because of the temperature variation in the bar, in the in the cellar, you know, even with the springtime and the temperature were rising up, so they 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 had a very nice surprise one morning, and they found when they opened up this bottle that was exposed to a, a temperature a higher temperature, uh, the bot the bot the, the bottle was uh, basically sparkling, was little fizzy, and then was the. Uh, uh, the first time that uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of a bottle fermentation for Prosecco was uh, created. Now, that this particular method now is no longer in the very common. It's called uh, Petnat or Colfondo in, 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 in our area. Colfondo, because the fondo is the, the sediments that are on the, bottle, on the bottom of the bottle. They were like, you know, kept uh, in, inside the bottle because at that time there were no uh, technologies like today to fil filter the wine, to clarify the wine, to clean the wine from the, from the sediment. So it was a very natural way to, to do this process. And, uh, and this was uh, you know, the natural, uh, the natural uh, um, process that uh, uh, came out. But then what happened with the modernization of the, of the, of the winemaking and uh, experimentation, the method Charmat that was actually invented by an Italian guy called uh, um, Martinotti. He was the guy that first uh, in the early uh, 1700, he started to produce this uh, first uh, method back in the days. And then of course, Charmat, uh, French, French guy took the, <laughs> the, 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 the mention to, to the credit, sorry, to to de deliver this method and then uh, patent the method officially. So today we call it method Charmant. Um, so anyway, again, I hope I, I respond to the, to the, to the question. Um, just uh, finishing about the, the Pinot Grigio and the Alto, the Alto Adige Valley, um, uh, similar like Prosecco where you have all these small little um, parcels and properties, vineyards, and you know, surrounded by villages and 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 woods. The same thing in the valley here. We have uh, like very small uh, vineyards and parcels. Um, just to give you an idea, there are like five thousand um, producer in Alto Adige and fifty five hundred hectares. Okay, so it's basically the size of each. Uh, uh, property is like 1.3, 1.2, uh, the average uh, um, size is 1.2 hectares per, per person, per, per owner. So it's a very small. And, and this gives you also the idea of uh, how we operate here, how my great grandfather has started all the process and the, 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 the family heritage in this valley that uh, we still work with the same families since the, the, the early 60s. Uh, about 30, 35 families, uh, and uh, you know we work with them since the the the, the, the hard, I mean the green harvest in January, or the trimming, or the pruning, and and so on. All the the, the decision are made together in the vineyards as as if we own the land. But because of the reason that I explained you, the historical reason that I explained you before. Um, that, that was not an option. So we had to uh, pursue the same uh, model that uh, all the other producer were doing here. And so that's uh, still a uh, part of this uh, um, heritage of this valley. So moving forward, I have uh, um, some other nice slides to, to, to share with you because as I mentioned before, you know, the, 
one of our key element factors, of course, is like the sustainability uh, that we uh, we always been uh, committed and and really we believe into this, uh, but not, not just for for marketing. Uh, uh, purposes because of course today it is a fact but also overall because we we really believe that you know in, in uh, you know working the land and the and the vineyards and it's 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 um it's a privilege so it's a it's an honor but it's also a privilege that we have uh, versus uh, our uh, you know community, our people, and uh, our future generations. So for that reason, uh, even before the, the the sustainability word uh, was invented for marketing purpose, you know we were sustainable before even that in our mentality, in our winemaking philosophy, and how we treat the, the vineyards, etc. So today we can enjoy a really uh, large uh, spectrum of uh, operations that we we do in our properties uh, from uh, water saving from uh, solar panels uh, to um, we have uh, the co2 emission control uh, uh, because uh, we have basically we're negative with all our capacity to self-generate uh, energy inside uh, um, through different uh, um, assets um, we we try to really preserve the, the 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 soil you know the soil because you know sometimes you you know you, we think about uh, exploit the, the the our 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 land our property because of the business but that's that's not going to pay off in the future so it's it's a very important for us and that that was one of the principle of of uh, you know of my great grandfather back in the days in the 1935 when he started. So these are sorry the, renew the renewable uh, energy system that I just mentioned on top of the of the of the winery. This is our headquarter. We also establish a biomass plant uh, to basically uh, um, transform all the the sediments from the from the agriculture, like the leftover sediments, into um, green energy that we. We give back also to the local community. Um, this is our uh, headquarter in, in Porto Groado. And uh, uh, the zero kilometers concept is basically what I was telling you before about uh, the, the glass production factory that is right across the street. So we call it zero kilo kilometers because we just bring the, the glass, the, the bottle of glass from one side to the other. And so we don't have any carbon, uh, carbon uh, uh, footprint um, ex emission you know, on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, 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 the importance of the, you know, the, the sustainability in our different vineyards, uh, the, the, the biodiversity, uh, the use also of, uh, of course, we abandoned, uh, we never use a lot of, uh, uh, you know, chemical and, and fertilizer back in the days, but definitely now it's completely abandoned. Um, we actually are experimenting new for new ways of treatments from uh, uh, homeopathic sort of homeopathic uh, um, treatments uh, for the grapes, uh, uh, which are even further in terms of uh, protocols than the organic uh, uh, treatments, okay, because organic treatments is basically uh, the base is like copper and and and, and sulfur that you it's copper and and, and zinc sorry and uh, and uh, and sulfur that you apply to the to the grapes to the leaves uh, but then these are also considered heavy metal so in a small portion are accepted by the by us but in a large portion they affect uh, our body but specifically the soil and um, and the uh, and the local biodiversity. So we 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 were trying in the past years to use uh, natural uh, um, natural uh, uh, medication. I call it like in the homeopathic medicine, like aloe aloe uh, pro properly um, against fun fungus. Um, also, we recently use a uh, um, yeah, like the the um, Orange, orange uh, um, 
peel, like, let's say, of the skin of the of the of the orange or, orange es essence essence that has been like uh, extracted by the the skin of the of the of the orange to to really work in the vineyards and try to uh, com you know compete against the disease, but in a, in a natural way that is really really important and it's it's working. So we're very proud of it. And then finally, we are, of course, uh, what we call vegan friendly, just for uh, all of us in, uh, you know, in turn this uh, uh, tonight in the, in the show, because, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking, are you, are your wines uh, vegan? And I say, yes, of course. I mean, there are the vegan, it's a big uh, uh, term today, but uh, sometimes it's also overused, but um, in, in the winemaking is basically referred to um, the absence of a certain uh, um, animal deriv derivates um, components that uh, they they can be used for filtering and clarifying the wines um, during the process. But in our winery, we never we, we never do that. So we don't we don't use them. And as a protocol, we use a different uh, ways to 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 to. To get to the same results, but without using any animal derivative derivative uh, derivative products. So, just uh, to make sure that everybody, also the vegan friends, they can drink our wine. And then finally, we move down uh, to Tuscany, though, where we have this beautiful uh, estate in the center, in the heart of the Tuscany, between Fl Florence and Siena. It's called uh, um, Panzano, the the little um, district where I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, famous uh, uh, butcher from from this uh, little district. It's called uh, Dario Cecchini, who's a, a big friend of mine too, and uh, and he's a and you know he's, he's amazing. He's like a, a talented uh, chef and, and butcher that has a very long history here. And uh, we're just a kilometer from, from his butcher shop, which is very well known in the US because a lot of tourists and people, they go there as a destination. So if you, ha if you haven't been yet, you should definitely go. And, uh, and this is like, uh, this uh, estate was uh, basically um, purchased from, from my, my family in the early 90s. Um, and we really worked hard to, to, in, to elevate this property and the vineyards and the, the, the experimentation. Uh, we're really at the right, uh, you know, at the, at, the, at the point that today these wines and this property are, are, are getting also very good recognition and, and prestigious, etc. cetera. Um, our Chianti Classico is a Chianti Classico Reserva tonight. So the Santa Margherita, which is this one here. And I'm gonna give you some notes if you have it uh, at home with you. So it comes from a single vineyard. It's called Salcetino. As I said, in the in the Greve in the Greve in Chianti uh, commune, but the district of Panzano, and it's a 90% Sangiovese with a little bit of a Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon from the same uh, um, from the same vineyards, and um, and it's about it's certified organic. As I said, this is this is one of the properties where we can really work uh, uh, close. To, to the vineyards and, and, and because of the microclimate that we have in Tuscany and the expertise. And it's a very uh, excellent uh, uh, training uh, set, you know, for, for our experimentation. So the wine, it uh, tends to be a dry, uh, but rich Sangiovese with, with a nice fruit at the beginning. But then of course, the, uh, you have like that almost a balsamic uh, um, note that comes out when it, it's, it's more age to it, when it has more age to it. Uh, it goes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the barrique, the, sorry, the, 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 the big cask, the Sangiovese and the, the barrique, the Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon uh, for a minimum of uh, 20, 24 months. This is the, the minimum of the, the reserva. And uh, yes, and uh, has a dry finish. And I always like to say it's uh, dry, rich, but rewarding. So definitely a good uh, example of uh, a quality driven uh, Sangiovese in this area. And then of course, we talk about wine, we talk about people and territory, how we cannot uh, 
finish about looking some uh, food options that are part of our everyday routine here. So I'm also very, you know, involved in this past uh, months as everybody to rediscover our own skill set for uh, food making as a little chef in the kitchen. And um, I try to make some uh, good uh, pairings with our wines uh, again. Uh, the Pinot Grigio uh, is very versatile, so we can uh, go from, uh, you know, more uh, uh, like an appetizer a dish, uh, like, uh, um, uh, like a Venetian uh, chiquetto, like a tapa style, and, uh, but also it can go with the other things, like um, a little bit more uh, um, sometimes uh, fusion with, uh, you know, like a twist uh, that uh, can be uh, not just Italian. Um, the Prosecco, same things. The Prosecco has a beautiful um, uh, uh, ability, you know, to, to, to be uh, versatile as well. Uh, I like it with the fried food usually a little bit better because of the, um, of the contrast between the bubbles and, and, uh, and the, and the, the, the oily component of the, of the fried food. Um, even here, you can go from vegetables, from um, uh, seafood, and then uh, even some, uh, some, uh, some meat-based uh, uh, dishes on the white, uh, white meat, uh, uh, definitely uh, side. Um, and, and the Sangiovese, Sangiovese perfect with the, with the you know, a, a steak, uh, with, uh, but also with pizza. I mean, we, we discovered the Sangiovese as a very good companion with the pizza and um, also with the different cheeses, lasagne, with a little bit of ragu beef, uh, um, uh, barbecue, of course. And so I don't wanna go too much now in that because uh, it's almost time for, for dinner. So, but as you can see, we have a lot of applications for these wines. Um, and on our website also, we're developing a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, consumer section on that. So you can be inspired and look at some recipes and, and, and try to make it on, on your own. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, finally, um, I want to go back to the north now with the last wine, which is our sparkling rosé from Santa Margherita, the ones that... Uh, it's most recent in our um, our you know history, and so I want to make a pop with you, a quick pop, since it's time for aperitivo. And uh, this is a wine that represents is a, it's a, also a Charmat method, so same method of uh, the, the, the the prosecco, but um, it's not called prosecco. Um, it is made by three different grapes, Glera, which is the base of Prosecco, Chardonnay, so Glera from the Val do Viadene area here, from our estate in the Prosecco Superiore, Glera from the Alto Adige, especially the Trentino uh, side of the valley, so the lower part here, and then the color is given by Malbec, that we have a little percentage in this northeast corner of the Venetian region. So a beautiful wine with, uh, um, it's a dry style, of course. Uh, I like the, the, the floral notes, the little berries, you know, the, flo the, the floral component. Uh, uh, as you see here, the, the, the pineapple uh, uh, remissions when it's a little bit on the, on the, on the uh, green side, not too mature. And, um, and it's, it's so delicate and elegant that uh, especially in a, in a patio outside situation, but not only now getting into the, the winter for, for holidays, of course, it's a, it's a very good companion for, for, for having fun together and without having too much, uh, you know, um, complexity, you know, and, 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 and it's a very, uh, very well balanced. So you can enjoy the color, the color you, can, you, can, you can enjoy the, the texture uh, the, of the wine with this uh, nice bouquet that really works well. Here, here I was, uh, you know, referring before to more like a, a fusion cuisine with a little bit of spicy twist 
because you have a little bit more backbone by the Chardonnay and uh, and acidity too that can uh, work, uh, you know, with more weight, you know, versus uh, uh, the Prosecco, which is a little bit more uh, casual, lighter, and then and, uh, and easy going. So I don't know if you have any other question for me. I know I'm about almost right with the, on time. Um, the last things I want to show you uh, is this uh, beautiful packaging that we are just uh, released into the market for the holidays. So we call it the holiday teens. And with this uh, kind of retro uh, style image uh, that brings back us back to our our roots, our tradition, our history in the in the early in the fifties, in the in the sixties, etc. And um, I think they are available now in a, you know all the stores, right? So I was happy to we hear shipping now. We get a very good. Uh, uh, feedback so far from uh, from different uh, markets and uh, and they're beautiful. I just got it here as well, and all my friends they they loved it. So, Chad, I think we're gonna have two of these, right? Um, yep, that's correct. I know we definitely have the Pinot Grigio and the Chianti currently shipping in market. Awesome. Yeah, these definitely make a great gift. Uh, for the wine lovers in your life, somebody who loves Santa Margarita, the tin ends up becoming a great keepsake. Or even somebody who collects tins. My mom saw a picture of these and she wants it just for the tin and I'll gladly take the wine. They are like the, 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 like the old chocolate um, boxes, you know, that they used to be back in the day. So you can also use it after, you know, after the gift or you know after the, the bottle you can reuse it at home in, you know during the holidays so i think it's a good uh, it's a good touch it's a good uh, offering great uh, we've got a question uh wanting to know if we will have the sparkling rosé in stock so we have the sparkling rosé uh just as a bottle available in our stores um and Chad might be able to tell us a little bit more about which stores it's available at, but at this time we won't be getting the tin. Um, let's see, we've got a few more questions. Victoria, I want you to know, you have so many comments from people telling you what a great presentation you have and the beautiful scenery. So I just, I wanted you to know that in case you can't see them all. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, I'm very happy. Uh, so we had a question kind of going back and forth that uh, Mary was kind of answering already, but just maybe for those who didn't see it in the chat bar. So it seems like quite a few of our viewers didn't realize that animal products were ever used in winemaking. Um, so can you maybe talk a little bit more about um, why animal products would be used in winemaking? Just I mean, for yes, sure. I mean, I don't want to get everybody, anybody concerned too much. But as I said, that they are like natural animal products. So what I'm, I'm referring to are, uh, you know, the eggs uh, white, for instance, or um, sort of um, uh, the, the, the fish stock um, that is gluey, gooey kind of. So those are like... Uh, uh, animal uh, components that were used and are used, but not always less, less and less than in the past. But some, some producer, they're probably they're still uh, use them. And uh, in our case, we, we, you know, as I said, we're now using them and uh, uh, we use a sort of a clays. Uh, so the soil clay that uh, in, still natural but it doesn't come from the from the uh, from animals so <laughs> it works in the same way for the for the filtration it's like a f the filtration and clarification uh, especially clarification uh, process of the wine uh, which is one of the common practices in the wine business that one's an entryway. sorry i have somebody knocking the door <laughs> oh, that's, that's perfectly all right well vittorio thank you so very much uh, we appreciate your time so much. You've got so many great comments here. Lots of Santa Margarita fans were tuning in tonight. And I mean, I learned uh, quite a bit from 
uh, your presentation tonight. And I like to consider myself, you know, maybe not a wine expert, but, you know, I'm, I'm working in it every day. So I feel like I at least know quite a bit and you taught me a lot tonight. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And I'm very happy. It makes a lot for me, you know, always very passionate. Uh, so it was a very good uh, time together. I appreciate it. And so for everybody on the line, if you're playing along with our passport program, I would like to just leave you uh, with tonight's code word. It is eco-friendly. And for those of you who are interested in joining us next week, we've got some great events going on next week as part of our 90 Days Around the World promotion. We have two tequilas, a mezcal. We've got the annual release of Beaujolais Nouveau. And then next Friday, we have another wine as well. So it's going to be a great week uh, here at the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets on our Facebook page. And um, you can also pre-register on Eventbrite and gain access to a couple of exclusive coupons and find out about some giveaways. So thank you everybody for tuning in. We hope you have a great weekend. Please uh, pick up some Santa Margarita wines, give the ones that you haven't tried yet a try or pick up some favorites uh, and please drink responsibly. Um, oh, actually, sorry, I'm just looking. It looks like we might have another comment. Oh, I thought it was a question, but it's actually just one of our attendees saying that they're gonna stop by the stores tomorrow to get some wine. So hey. you go David, you get some wine. So, thanks everybody, good night. Ciao. Grazie.